Acts 20 is famous for Paul's charge to the Ephesian elders. He's telling them goodbye for the last time. He's on his third and last missionary journey. He's trying to get to Jerusalem. And uh, the last verse of chapter 20 says that they accompany him to the ship. It's very obvious that Luke loves to write about a sea voyage. He gives lots more details than we would think would be absolutely necessary. The great masterpiece of sea travel narrative comes in chapter 27 where he talks about Paul's shipwreck. And we'll get to that today, God willing. But um, he was with the Apostle Paul. He delighted in these details of travel. He describes the, the route that they take, island hopping uh, on the way to Israel, coming to uh, Phoenicia um, via, um, via Cyprus, landing at Tyre, which is uh, one of the two great ancient Phoenician cities in verse 3. And then in verse 4, we come to one of the great themes of Acts 21. The Holy Spirit has gifted different people to know what's going to happen. And more than one person tries to stop Paul from going to Jerusalem. And it begins to happen in Acts 21.4. They kept telling Paul through the Spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. They journey on through Tyre, verse 7, and they come to Caesarea, which is about 65 miles from Jerusalem. And they come to the home of Philip the Evangelist. This is the same Philip who led the Ethiopian eunuch to Christ and who, who ministered in Samaria in chapter 8. In chapter 6, he's called Philip the deacon. In chapter 21, he's called Philip the Evangelist. And evidently, he's settled down with a family in Caesarea by the time we get to Acts 21. He's got four unmarried daughters. And they, too, have a gift of prophecy. And um, there was staying at his house another prophet from Jerusalem called Agabus. He's mentioned earlier, we think it's the same Agabus who's mentioned in Acts chapter 11, sent from the church in Jerusalem to the church at, at Antioch. And this Agabus, in a very dramatic way, by tying his own uh, um, uh, tying the feet and hands, his own feet and hands with Paul's belt, uh, he says that, that this is what the Jews in Jerusalem are going to do to you if you go down there. They're going to tie you up. They're going to make you a prisoner. and They're going to turn you over to the Gentiles. And everyone, including Luke, in verse 12, beg Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And Paul says in verse 13, why, why are you breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 14 says, when we realized that we couldn't talk him out of it, we said God's will be done. Now, some scholars who've studied these passages see a problem here because they see that uh, they, they sense that the Holy Spirit is trying to stop Paul from going, and yet Paul, who supposedly is in the Spirit, insists on going, and they suggest that there's a contradiction here. There isn't any contradiction. The Holy Spirit indicated that great persecution would come to Paul in Jerusalem. Paul already knew that. Paul never denied that. Those who knew that that was going to happen assumed that that meant it was not God, God's will for Paul to go to Jerusalem. That was a false assumption. In other words, the Holy Spirit gave these people knowledge 
to know that suffering and persecution lay ahead in Jerusalem. But the Holy Spirit did not lead these people to stop Paul. Paul was in God's will when he went to Jerusalem. Paul was in God's will when he suffered. Paul was in God's will when he died. You know, um, sometimes Paul fled. He flees from Berea. He flees from Thessaloniki. Uh, eventually, he flees from, from Lystra in Acts 14, even though he goes back several times. He flees in the original episode after his conversion in Damascus by going over the wall. But a time comes when he stops fleeing and he faces the danger and he, right, he walks right toward the danger. And that's the same thing Jesus did. When Jesus preached in the synagogue of Nazareth, they took him outside the city and they tried to throw him off a cliff and kill him. But it says that he evaded them. He passed through their midst. At other times, they tried to lay hands on him. They couldn't. But a time comes when he faces them. A time comes when he allows them to arrest him, to tie him up, to beat him, to spit on him, to torture him, and to kill him. That time comes. And so Paul is not led to run away from something that he knows is going to be hard, something that he knows is, is going to be um, painful. Verse 15 says that they started, uh, or we started, on our way to Jerusalem. Now, in Jerusalem, Paul has another meeting with James. When we read the book of Galatians, we see that he probably had two meetings with James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, before the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. So probably this is at least his fourth meeting with James. Now, two things have happened since his last meeting with James. Thousands of Jews have become Christians, although eventually the church will become dominated by Gentiles, but there are not many Gentiles in Jerusalem. So in Jerusalem, the people who became Christians would be mostly Jews. James says that thousands of um, Jews have become Christians. That's what it says in verse 20. And they were zealous for the law. That is, they were keeping the law of Moses. So one thing that's happened is that there have been thousands of Jewish converts. The second thing that has happened is that Paul has become famous among these Jews. He's become famous for the wrong reason. The Jews have the impression that he's telling everybody that the law is no good, and he's telling everybody that he's telling the Jews who are becoming Christians that they don't need to keep any part of the law, and that's gotten everybody very, very upset. Now, when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says that if he's, if he's got to lead a vegetarian to Christ, he'll become a vegetarian. If he's got to lead somebody to Christ who's under the law, he will be under the law. The law cannot save us, and the law of Moses cannot profit us. Now, most Christians, most Christian scholar, scholars say this about the Christian's relationship with the Old Testament law. Most Christian scholars say that there are three parts to the law. There's the civil law, which is the way we govern the land, the way we keep people in order with policemen and taxes and that kind of, kind of thing. That's the civil law. There's the ceremonial law, those rituals that we go through to practice our religion. And there's the moral law or the ethical law, which tells us how to behave toward God and toward our neighbor as summarized in the Ten Commandments. And most Christian scholars say that the Christian is not under the civil law or the ceremonial law, 
but the moral law. This is the position of Protestant Reformed theology, and this is the position of most Christian scholars. Um, and there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that position. I do think it has some problems. There are actually 613 commandments in the Old Testament. There's not just 10 commandments, there's 613 commandments. And the Old Testament does not make a distinction between the ceremonial law, the civil law, and the moral law. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about the law as a code, as a united code. Actually, James himself says this, because James writes in James 2, that if we, if we sin against, if we break one part of the law, we've broken the whole law. And the law was actually nailed to the cross with Christ. Christ fulfilled the law. Now, those people who say, but we're under the moral law, the Ten Commandments, that, that, those moral portions of the law, what they're afraid of is that if we don't say that, then Christians will be without law. There's a word for that, and that's antinomian, that we will become Christians who just say, well, we're saved by grace. God is going to forgive us. We can do anything we want to do. Paul was actually accused of that. He talks about it in the book of Romans, and he says, that's not what I'm saying at all. But you know, there's another way to look at our relationship to the law. There's another way besides just saying, well, we've got to extract the moral concerns out of these 613 commandments in the Old Testament, and we leave the civil and the ceremonial law. There's actually another way of looking at it, and that way is this. We can say that we're not under the Mosaic law at all. We are new covenant people. We have a new priesthood. The book of Hebrews says where there's a change of priesthood, there has to also be a change of law. Aaron is not our priest. Levi is not our priest. Jesus is our priest. And Jesus is a priest not according to the order of Aaron or Levi. Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek, this amazing king priest who's mentioned in two chapters of the Old Testament, Genesis 14 and Psalm 110. What then is our law? Well, Romans 8 speaks of the the uh, law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Our law is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. James 2 speaks of the royal law. Ours is the royal law, the law of the king. Our priest is not only a priest, but he's a king, which was impossible in the Old Testament arrangement. And Galatians 6 speaks of something called the law of Christ. Well, what is the law of Christ? Well, I would say it's all the commands of the New Testament. Now, for those who are worried, oh, well, if you, if you say we're not under the law, then Christians are going to do whatever they want to do. Let me tell you something. The law of Christ is much more thorough and comprehensive than the law of Moses because the law of Christ is concerned mainly with internal realities. Moses tells me that I cannot commit murder and that I can't, cannot commit adultery. Well, if I'm having a good day, I can avoid murder or adultery. But Christ doesn't stop there. Christ tells me that I cannot be angry. And Christ tells me that I cannot want another, uh, that I cannot lust after a woman that I'm not married to. I'm not allowed to desire a woman that I'm not married to. That's much more difficult for a man. And so we don't have to worry that if we're under the law of Christ, that we have no law and that we're throwing away the law of Moses. We have a new priest, we have a, a new covenant, and we have a new, new law, and it's the law of Christ. But Christians look at it different ways. And the way that I look at it, and the way that I just explained it to you, is minority. That's the minority view among Christians. Most great Christian scholars simply say, we're under the moral law. The book I've, I've been using more than any in these studies is John Stott's uh, commentary in the book of Acts. John Stott was a wonderful preacher in, in London for many years. He retired in 1975 to travel. He's still alive. He's going to be 90 years old in a couple of months. And uh, he's in retirement in a nursing home in Keswick, England. 
He's a, he was a wonderful preacher. You can listen to his sermons online. And um, John Stott says we're under the moral law, that we get the moral law from Moses. He's in the majority of scholars. He's in the majority of expositors. But the great question when Paul got to Jerusalem from James was, what are we going to do with all these people who are upset because they said you did away with the law? And basically, there was no problem about telling Gentiles they weren't under the law. All they told the Gentiles is don't commit sexual immorality, don't eat uh, meat which has been strangled, don't eat the blood, and don't eat meat which has been sacrificed to idols. Now, three of those four requirements are ceremonial. They're not moral, they're ceremonial. Only one of them is moral, and that has to do with, with sexual immorality. So. The, the, what, what then would the Gentiles be responsible for? Only those four things? No. The Gentiles are responsible for all the commandments of the New Testament, which covers at least as much ground as the Mosaic Law covered and more. But what about the Jews? What does Paul do? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians that there are some people who are weak. There's some people who, who believe you've got to keep this rule or you've got to keep that rule. You can't eat this thing or you can't be involved in that activity. And Paul says, I may not share that conviction. I may say, I have freedom in Christ. That's legalism. But so I don't upset that person. And so he's not tempted to do what I'm doing and have his conscience defiled. I will restrict my liberty to minister to him. And so here's what James says to um, Paul. He says, we have four men here. They're well-known men, and they've taken a very strict Old Testament vow. It's probably the Nazareth vow that we read about in Numbers chapter 6. Samson was under a Nazarite vow, but he broke all the rules, and that's what got him into trouble. And so James says, why don't you get under this vow and help these men with this vow and everybody will know about it and then everybody will calm down and people won't be so upset about you. Well, Paul agrees to do that. He doesn't say, no, we preach salvation by grace through faith. We don't need to keep these silly rules anymore. He says, no, 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 I'll be happy to do that. If that will make people feel better, I will, I will do that. So he does it, verse 26. He took the men and he purified himself, and he went to the temple. But in the temple, he was noticed, and he was attacked by a mob. Now, here's what happens for the rest of the book of Acts. Up until this point, Paul was on the offensive. He was on the offensive as Saul of Tarsus. He was on the offensive as Paul the missionary. But from this point on, for the rest of the book of Acts, Luke is concerned to tell us about the attacks upon Paul, physical attacks and legal attacks, and the way that Paul defended himself. While we continue being a benevolent project, your kind donations will continue to be vital in fulfilling the calling of TFS ministry. We do count on your gracious support and cooperation. For detailed information, visit www.tvseminary.com. Some people believe that one of the reasons Luke wrote the book of Acts was to help prepare a manual for lawyers and witnesses and judges who would be involved in coming to a decision, a verdict, about what should happen to the Apostle Paul under Roman law, and that Luke is telling the story. Because for the rest of the book of Acts, we learn a lot about what's happening legally. We have lots and lots and lots of details. It's not like there's a great deal of Christian teaching. We have a history of the prosecution of the Apostle Paul and Paul's defense. Now, why would the Holy Spirit allow so much Scripture to be given to such a subject that might not seem that practical or that useful? Well, I would say 
first of all, for the sake of accurate history. And you know, for the first few hundred years of the existence of the Christian church, Rome was in charge of things. And it would take 300 years before Rome stopped bothering the Christians. And it would be very useful for there to be a document which went into detail about all the reasons why Rome should not bother Christians and why Christians should have freedom. But I think there's a, apart from history and apart from the usefulness in the first 300 years of Christianity, I think it's also very valuable for us because we may have opportunities to be threatened by law and be persecuted. And we need a model. We need a handbook. Nikki's grandparents and great-grandparents were persecuted for Christianity. And uh, we may get our chance. We may get our opportunity. We may get our opportunity in America. Things are changing quickly in America. Christians may be fleeing America to come to Russia to have religious freedom one day. The world is changing, changing quickly. So we have this great pattern and we have this great model. So um, the crowd catches up to him. There's a mob, verse 28. They accuse Paul of preaching against the law. They tell lies about him. They say that he brought Gentiles into that part of the temple which was restricted to the Jews. Um, there was a, an outer court in the temple called the uh, Court of the Gentiles. But then there was a four and a half foot wall, concrete wall, that separated the Court of the Gentiles from the inner court. And only Jews could go past that wall. Well, Paul had been seen in Jerusalem with Trophimus. Trophimus, who's mentioned in 2 Timothy 4. Trophimus was a Gentile. And because they saw Paul with, with the Gentile in Jerusalem, and because they saw Paul at the temple, they came to the conclusion that Paul must have taken Gentiles into the temple, or they just, they just lied to get him in, into trouble. They said he took Gentiles into the temple, but he didn't. And in fact, in fact, he did not do this. Verse 30 says, all the people were aroused and they rushed together and they, they took hold of Paul and they were dragging him out of the temple. They're, they were going to do to him what they did to Stephen. Paul participated in the execution of Stephen, Acts chapter 7. It looks like in Acts chapter 21 that the very same thing is going to happen to Paul. By the way, notice the end of verse 30, Acts 21, verse 30. Immediately the doors were shut. You know, that's probably not just the account of an eyewitness. That's probably not just a historical um, notation. That's probably a literary touch and a symbolical illusion. This may signal the death of Judaism as far as the future prospects of there being a national repentance and the Jews receiving Christ as a Savior, at least a prospect which has lasted over 2,000 years. Paul comes to witness to the grace of God. They're dragging him out. They're going to kill him. And immediately, the doors of the prison were shut. Well, at that time, by the grace of God, the Roman commander heard that there was a riot. And he rushed, rushed to that part of Jerusalem with soldiers, and he rescued Paul. It says in verse 32 that they stopped beating him. But the commander ordered Paul to be put in chains, and um, he, um, as he was carrying him away, Paul began to speak to the soldier in Greek. Now, the commander thought that Paul was an Egyptian. And when he began to speak in very polished, very fluent, very high-class Greek, the commander realized that his prisoner was someone of refinement, of elegance, of training, of importance. He says in verse 37 to Paul, Do you know Greek? 
You're not the Egyptian who led the, the rebellion. Paul says in verse 39, I am a Jew of Tarsus in Cilicia, and it's that I'm a citizen of no insignificant city. In other words, I'm not from a little place. I'm from a big place, from an important place, and I'm a Roman citizen. And by the way, one of the great universities in the ancient world was in Tarsus, was in Paul's hometown, in the place where he was born. Um, would you allow me to speak to the people? And so the commander stopped on the stairs, and the commander gave Paul permission, and the crowd got quiet. He had been speaking to the Roman commander in Greek. Now he addresses the crowd in Hebrew. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.